Good morning. morning. The kids are waving the palm branches. It must be Palm Sunday. That's pretty cute, wasn't it? I think my son, who's 33, uh, also wanted to wave the palm branches as well. (laughs) Thank you for braving the snow this morning. Um, What's the saying? In like a lamb, out like a lion, something like that. Uh, We have a lion this morning. So thank you for braving the weather to come to worship. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I invite you to stand. Let's uh, join together in our call to worship. King Jesus comes. King Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, Messiah. Hail, King Jesus, King of all. Recall the words of the scriptures. A great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Amen. Let's turn our attention to our worship screen as we sing together all glory, laud, and honor. Our God indeed is a good and gracious king. Let's open our worship with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we enter this time of worship on this Palm Sunday, even though it's a snowy Palm Sunday, we pray that we would sense your presence among us. Today we are reminded how the people so long ago proclaimed Jesus as king without really realizing what that title meant and what it meant for their lives especially. May we embrace our King today anew, and may we worship in spirit and truth, 
May our worship reflect our love for Jesus, who is not only our King, but our Lord and our Savior. We ask these things in his most precious name. Amen. Good morning and God bless you for joining us through our television ministry today. Let's take just a second and welcome each other. Good morning. Any announcements this morning? Gerald's got the microphone ready. He's ready to go. I can see him. Any announcements today? Well, it is Palm Sunday, which means it's the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, it also means it's the beginning of our, our Lenten services uh, that will be held out at Hutter Tall this year. Uh, that begins tonight at 7 p.m. Information about that is found in the inside of your bulletin. Um, I, I'm hoping the weather cooperates. I don't know. Um, I always thought I, you know, I, I wish I had the same standards as weathermen where I, you know, if I'm right, great. If I'm not, well, I missed it, you know. <laughs> I like to be right 30% of the time. That's what I try to, try to hit for. So I saw a thing on Facebook that uh, we're supposed to get between 1 and 78 inches of snow. <laughs> Something like that. So it depends on where you are. But. So hopefully the weather cooperates and you can join, uh, join us for our uh, Holy Week services tonight at Huttertal. Uh, Michelle... Let's see, how do you pronounce your last name? Hirschberger. Uh, she is a professor of Bible and ministry at Heston College. She'll be the speaker for this week, so I'm sure she'll have some interesting things to say. Also, just a reminder, um, this coming Thursday, we'll be having our Maundy Thursday service. Um, so the communion schedule for, for this month is uh, a little bit messed up. I guess the communion schedule for going forward now is messed up because we'll be having communion on Maundy Thursday, a little... Uh, special way we do things for that, so please mark your calendars for a Monday Thursday service. Other announcements today? Please note next week, uh, because it is Easter, we will not have fellowship time or Sunday school. Hopefully the snow will be gone by then. Who knows, right? But it is uh, that time of the year to get together with family to celebrate the, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we do want to Make sure we spend lots of, lots of time and uh, attention uh, doing the things that are meaningful to us, which is worship, which is spending time with family. Um, so just keep that in your mind for next Sunday. How about a prayer request today? Anything on your hearts? For those of you who uh, haven't noticed, I, I, I have a, a device with me today. I'm starting a club. It's called the Cane Club. Uh, some people are already members. Um, Gordon and Jake, thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's an exclusive club. Um, you got to have something wrong with your legs <laughs> or strength or whatever the case might be, balance. So I am now officially a member of the Cane Club, at least for a while. So um, bear with me as I meander upstairs a little slower than normal. But <laughs> I would draw your attention to the names on our prayer list. I had a bit of an interesting week last week. Um, I, I spent some time in the emergency room for a supposed, suspected, I should say, blood clot, um, and had a lot of pain and, and did different things like that. So I talked with different people throughout the week, and I, I believe I remember talking to somebody about this, that the news organization, some news organization, had done a special on Kobe Sherman. Is that correct? Can anybody verify that? Yes? Yes. I wasn't dreaming that. Um, was that uh, Kelloland that did that, or is that? That's, that's the TV. South Dakota Public TV, okay, yeah. And was that already aired, or is that coming up, or? It was already aired during the daytime. Okay, so they just kind of did a, a little bit of a, a story about his journey, uh, going down to MD Anderson, dealing with cancer, all that kinds of thing. Um, that was very good. It, it draws awareness to uh, different kinds of cancer, especially the kind of cancer that Kobe's dealing with. So I'm sure his, he was very appreciative of that, and I'm sure his family was very appreciative of that. So, yeah, wonderful. We do have um, several names on our prayer list. Uh, we want to continue to pray for the family of Irene Gross. We celebrated her homegoing last Wednesday. Uh, we have these flowers that uh, were left here on, on her behalf to, to decorate the church, so thank you for that. Um, we want to continue to pray for both LaVon and Daryl Walter. Is LaVon recovering okay? 
Good spirits? Happy-go-lucky? You don't have to answer that. Anna Mae Zimmerman, she doing okay? She's recovering at home. She's weak, but okay. she's better. Okay. All right. And then, of course, we have Kobe Sherman and also uh, Amy Walter. You know, um, we say this often, but prayer is a, an ongoing thing that we are called to do. It's, uh, you know, sometimes I think it's a, we think of it as a one and done sort of a thing. God help with this, and then we never, never think about it again. That's not really the way that prayer is meant to work. It's supposed to be a communication, an ongoing communication between us and God. And we, we're trying to find God's will. And sometimes um, the way that we pray, we can find God's will pretty easily. And sometimes it takes a while. Uh, we also know that God answers prayer according to his good and perfect timing, which, believe it or not, oftentimes is different than our timing. Have you ever found that to be true in your life? You prayed for something and you say, God, I'd like to have this happen now. Um, but maybe it's, it's not meant to happen for quite some time. And so it's that gift of prayer that also helps us in our own faith to grow and to mature and to, to, uh, to learn more about who our God is and what he wants from us. So just because we have people on our list for uh, extended periods of time, uh, we keep praying. And we, we just keep on doing that until we uh, know what God's answer is. And then we praise God for his answer. Any other prayer requests with us this morning? Well, indeed, we're thankful for all the kids. Uh, it's always a treat to see the kids in church. Where there's kids in church, there's a, a church with a future. So it's a, a blessing to have our kids with us today. As we go to the Lord in prayer, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we know that sometimes coming to worship is a sacrifice. Uh, for various reasons, but in the place where we live, sometimes weather is the issue. So we thank you for those who have made the sacrifice to come to church today, to be in your house, to be with your people, to celebrate this Palm Sunday. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to recognize that we have been in the presence of God, so that when we leave this place, we're refreshed, we're renewed, we're inspired to share Jesus with those people around us that we'll meet during this week. Father, we thank you for all the kids who are with us today. Just their presence reminds us of our responsibility as adults, as adult Christians especially, that we have a responsibility to teach the faith. We have a responsibility to guard our children, to, to instruct them, to discipline them when they go wrong, to help them, Lord, to come to faith early in their life, to know what it means to follow Jesus, to love Jesus, and to be loved by Jesus. So help us in that very important task to be, to be faithful, to be faithful examples of what it means to be a disciple. So when they look at us, they might have just a glimpse, and just a clue of what it means to follow Jesus so that they can imitate us as well. There's a natural discipleship relationship that exists with just simply being a parent. And so, Father, we ask for your blessing upon our kids. We ask that you would guard their minds and their hearts from all the, the, the evil and the wickedness that's in this culture. Help them to be children after your own heart. Help them to explore the wonders of your creation and to be inspired by it. Father, we ask for your goodness to be with those who are mourning. We think of the, the Muchuknos family and, and the Gross family at the loss of Irene. We know that she was a dear and special lady. But our hope is in you. And that is a common hope that we all share. That we get to be with you in heaven when this life comes to an end. And because of that, Lord, our grief is okay. Because we grieve under the shelter of your grace and mercy and under your promise. We thank you for the work you're doing in Kobe Sherman's life. We know any kind of cancer battle is a long battle. And so all we can pray for is strength for each new day, that you would use these different medical facilities that he's visiting as instruments of God, instruments of healing, knowing ultimately, Lord, that you are the healer. And so we pray that Kobe's faith would be strengthened by this this experience in his life and that those around him would be inspired because of his faith. Use him, Lord, for your, for your glory, for your kingdom's sake, to draw others 
to our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, there are so many among us who are dealing with various things, whether it's broken hips from falls, whether it's just issues of getting old and memory loss and things like that. And so to that end, Father, we pray for Daryl and LaVon Walter. We know this is a, a different stage in their journey of life, one that they have to get used to, and that's a little bit hard. So give them the courage, Lord, to allow people to take care of them, to love them, to surround them. And Father, we just ask that both Daryl and LaVon would know that you are near, that they are children of God, they are secure in their relationship with you, and no one can take them from that very safe place, that secure place. For all those who are recovering from various things, Lord, we just ask for quick recoveries. Anytime we deal with things that are taking us out of the normal routines of life, it's a, it's a hassle for us, it's a chance for us to, to stop, to think about all the things that we have going on in our life, to maybe even ponder ways that we can remove some of that busyness so that we can better serve you. So as we heal from various illnesses and injuries, we pray, Lord, that we would take that time to stop, to slow down, to turn our eyes heavenward, and to keep our eyes fixed towards Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Thank you for this church and the ministries that you have blessed us with. Open new doors of opportunities that we might walk through them faithfully and serve you in building your kingdom in this place. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your patience with us. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Let us continue our worship through the giving of our tithes and offering. Let our elders, or our ushers rather, please come forward. I invite you to stand as we sing together the doxology.
nothing in your sight. And yet you are blessed when we give to you. And we are blessed because we recognize that all that we have comes from your gracious hand. We ask that these tithes and these offerings that we give to you would be multiplied and used in such a way that brings you and your kingdom the most glory. May our contribution serve to build the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Please remain standing and turn your attention once again to our worship screen as we sing in the name of the Lord, and we'll sing this twice. morning we'll be reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, found on page 1003 in your pew Bibles. If you'd like to follow along. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll bring it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the streets, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of our Lord. This morning we're looking at this event in the life of Jesus, commonly known as the triumphal entry. This is presented to us in kind of a celebratory atmosphere, much like a parade would be celebratory. In fact, a parade is an event that probably helps, best, helps us best imagine the kind of thing that's actually happened here. This event is so important that all four Gospels record it and give their own take on the things that were taking place as Jesus made his way into the Holy City. And the reason it is referred to as the triumphal entry is because it is at this time that, and at this place that Jesus finally reveals himself to the public as the king. It's been a long time, but now he reveals himself to be the king. These kinds of victory parades were common in the ancient world. For example, when King David rode into the city of Jerusalem after a great battle, the people came out to meet him, shouting their accolades, shouting their praises. And we find another example in one of the extra books found in uh, Catholic Bibles called the Apocrypha. Some people might be familiar with the Apocrypha. These are, generally speaking, intertestamental books that largely deal with what happened with the Jewish people in between the Babylonian captivity and and the time of the New Testament. But in the book of, of uh, First Maccabees, Simon Maccabeus defeats a great army and he restores the city of Jerusalem to the people. He gives it back to them. And First Maccabees 13.51 says this, On the 23rd day of the second month in the year 171, the Jews entered Jerusalem with praise and palm branches, with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments and with hymns and songs. It's a party. It's a parade. It's a celebration. 
A great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. And now it seems the people were recognizing that another great victory victory was soon to be upon them again. Jesus was coming into the holy city. And can we say that the people were very much expecting Jesus to do something that would bring them victory once again? The tension within this event can be found with what the people were expecting Jesus to do and what Jesus actually came to do. As we will soon discover, these two things were very, very different. In the Gospel of Mark, especially, we find what theologians call the messianic secret. This is really nothing more than Jesus doing things that Jesus does. He's performing miracles, he's doing signs, and After he does these things, he tells the people who experiences their blessings not to tell anybody about it. Just be quiet about this. I don't want anybody to know about this. Too soon, anyway. And therefore, we have this thing called the Messianic secret. So all throughout the Gospel of Mark, we as the readers know the secret. But those surrounding Jesus are kept in the the dark until the proper time. And that proper time is now. However, Jesus is not going to stand up and make an announcement about who he is and what God had had sent him to do. Instead, the revelation of the messianic secret, secret is going to be carefully revealed through Jesus' actions. That is to say, Jesus is going to purposefully do things that reveal his identity, who he is. Some people, no doubt, over the course of Jesus' three and a half year ministry, had suspicions about his identity of who he is. They thought maybe, ah, he might be the Messiah. And perhaps others thought about the possibility of Jesus fulfilling that role and then dismissing it. Now he can't be the Messiah. Whatever the case might be, what we can be certain of is that the people will not understand, even after, after it's revealed, this messianic secret. Even the disciples won't understand it. You see, the basic human nature is that we create our own images and our own expectations of how we think something should be. Have you ever done that? And when something seems to fit with our general hope and our general expectation, we then superimpose our expectations on that thing and, of course, the desired outcome that we are envisioning envisioning because of that thing. I see this kind of thing all the time when uh, we're talking about things like the end times events. There are lots of people who, who seem to live on high alert all the time about the end times. Have you ever come across somebody like that? All the time. I remember when the internet became a household word, and I heard how many people say that the designation www dot, well, that www was the mark of the beast somehow being tied to the number 666. So don't use the internet because you're taking the mark of the beast. That was one example of that. Or anytime war starts up somewhere in the world, people say, well, at the end times, there's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars, so the end times are here. There hasn't been much time in history throughout the whole world where there hasn't been wars going on because that's just human nature. We fight. We do bad things to each other. Or anytime anything happens in Israel, the, the end times people go on high alert. Israel just began excavating a new apartment building in Syria. Must be the end times. I'm being a little facetious, of course, and I don't mean to make light of this area because there are certainly things that we should be aware of when it comes to end times theology. The point I'm trying to make is that we are often guilty of seeing what we want to see in certain events and interpreting them in a manner that fits with our own expectations. We do that all the time. And that is exactly what we find here as we see this crowd of people surrounding Jesus and hailing him as he makes his way into the holy city. They see what they want to see. But if they had only observed the symbolism that Jesus was purposefully portraying for them, they would have understood the true message that he was giving to them. And the first thing that we can see is that Jesus' approach to Jerusalem was to be a fulfillment of prophecy. In years past, I've drawn attention to the fact that there's this great importance placed on uh, the procuring of the donkey, a very specific donkey. Jesus had spent three and a half years traveling on foot from village to village, sharing the gospel message, and now he traveled with his disciples, and he's only two miles from the city of Jerusalem. Could Jesus not walk the remaining two miles into the city? Were his feet tired? No. 
Nothing like that. Jesus is going to make a very profound statement as he makes this last leg of his journey into the city. Mark says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to, the, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you'll find a cold tide there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. So Jesus is going to make his entry into the city while riding on a donkey's colt, one that has never been ridden. Of course, the question is, why does he want to do this? Why is it so important for him to ride this, this little donkey? My wife and I are kind of rodeo fans, and we've been going to lots of rodeos over the past several years, and we've seen how unbroken horses react when one of the cowboys try to get on it. It's a life-threatening thing. Now, I don't know if donkeys follow that same pattern, but I can imagine that a colt that has never been away from his mama is not going to be very happy when somebody tries to sit on it. Maybe that's just me. Maybe it's my imagination. I don't know. But Jesus, whatever the case, he, he, needs to, he needs to get this donkey. He needs this donkey's colt. He needs it. But notice that Jesus needs it only for a short while. And once he's done with it, the owners will, uh, will get the, the colt back. He promises, if anyone asks of you why you're doing this, say, the Lord needs it and we will send it back here shortly. We're just going to borrow it. So again, we ask, what's so important about this donkey? Donkeys are stubborn creatures, aren't they? And the answer to that question is that the donkey is going to provide the needed visual for the message that Jesus will be given as he rides into the city. This is not a vocal message, of course. In fact, it is a message that was going to require no words at all. By riding this donkey's colt on this last leg of the journey into the holy city of Jerusalem, Jesus will be making a clear and profound statement about who he is, who his identity is, who he is, who God has sent him to be. This identity and this mission is rooted in prophecy. One of the main prophecies concerning the coming Messiah and coming into the city is found in Zechariah 9.9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, but lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. In fact, John's gospel actually quotes this passage in his discussion of Jesus' triumphal entry so that there is no question as to what Jesus is doing here. The two disciples that Jesus had sent to procure the donkey found it, just as he said, as they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway, they untied it, and some of the people standing there said, what are you doing, untying this colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Jesus now had the colt. He was prepared to present his unspoken message to the people. But the question is, would the people have the spiritual insights to receive the message that Jesus was relaying to them through his actions? Certainly they too must have wondered about this, this need for the donkey. What's the big deal? Jesus' approach to Jerusalem was to be a fulfillment of prophecy. But now we can say outright what we've already alluded to, and that the people had their own expectations for Jesus. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they, they threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wonderful. Exciting. Jesus is doing something great here. The people recognize it. Great military leaders and conquerors often return from battle riding a mighty victory steed, a, a mighty white war horse. In fact, King David himself had done that. But if you notice, it's almost like the people ignore the mode of transportation altogether. It's like it's not even there. They ignored it and they continued on with treating Jesus just like they would have treated any conquering hero. They threw their cloaks on the road like they did for Simon Maccabeus. They waved palm branches, which was done as a sign of victory and national pride. And they shout on Jesus' behalf, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is our guy. What the people who are shouting is actually part of Psalm 118, 
which says, Lord, save us. That's what Hosanna means. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So for all intents and purposes, these people made all the right connections, except one. They recognized that Jesus was God's Messiah. They recognized that Jesus represents the kingdom of their father, David. They even recognized that the Messiah of God comes with the power to save. But from what did the people want to be saved? What was their hope of salvation? Or perhaps we, we could ask it this way. What did the people think that Jesus came to do? Because I can guarantee it's not what they wanted him to do. You see, the one thing they missed or perhaps ignored was the donkey's cult. Keeps, we keep coming back in, to the donkey. Jesus went out of his way to get it, to show himself upon it, to be seen riding it into the city. But the people missed the meaning of the donkey altogether. What is a donkey used for? Well, donkeys are, are used as beasts of burden. They carry heavy things. They, they do work. Donkeys were not the animal of choice for triumphant kings or victorious military leaders. It sends a different message altogether, doesn't it? Donkeys represented humility and service and submission. Why didn't the people recognize that? The answer is that they didn't want to recognize that. They just didn't want to. Jesus was finally revealing himself to the masses. He was revealing himself to be the Messiah. And the response of the people tells us that they understood that Jesus was showing himself to be the Messiah. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Savior had come. But what did the people want salvation from? That was the question. Probably the same kinds of things that people today want salvation from, right? Lord, save now. Lord, save us from those wicked Democrats or those rotten Republicans. Lord, save me from this toxic relationship that somehow I got myself into. I can't get out of it. Lord, save me. Lord, save me from my financial woes because I'm in way over my head and I don't see any way out. I need a savior. Lord, save me from whatever it is. You fill in the blank. What these ancient people had in their minds when it came to God's salvation was, Lord, save us from these awful Romans who have come and occupied our country and keep us in subjection. We don't want to pay their taxes anymore. Just like these people who threw their coats before Jesus and waved palm branches shouting, Hosanna, we too can have the wrong idea about the kind of salvation that Jesus brings. We can have our own motivations. We can have our own expectations of him. And people do all the time. Our own agendas for him to follow. Not for us to follow, for Jesus to follow. Lord, we want you to do this for us. And so we can see that the people have their own expectations for Jesus. And that leads us to our final point for this morning. That the people failed to recognize the presence of God in their midst. Amidst all that, they missed it. After all the preparation, after the joyous shouts and parade-like atmosphere they, that accompanied Jesus as he made his way in this triumphal entry, we read something that really almost sounds like a mistake. Jesus entered into Jerusalem. He's there. He's in the holy city. He goes into the temple courts, the place where worship happens, where God is supposed to dwell. And Mark tells us, he looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. What? <laughs> That's it? That's all we get? What happened to the people? What happened to the parade? What happened to the shouts of acclamation? Jesus finally gets into Jerusalem. He makes his way into the very temple courts. He's the Messiah. And he looks around for a minute. And he leaves. Because it was getting late? Getting late? Did he have something else to do? Was supper on? Getting cold? Why did Mark build up this whole scene only to bring it to such an anticlimactic end? Disappointing. 
Well, I read an interesting thing, uh, a take really, by one particular pastor that argued that the reason Jesus wanted to head back to Bethany so that he could return the donkey that he borrowed. <laughs> well, uh, in fact, uh, in that understanding, Jesus was keeping his word by returning the donkey before he moved on to do all the other stuff that he was going to be doing for the rest of the week. He was getting his affairs in order, and therefore Jesus provides an example for us to follow. We need to get our affairs in order, something along those lines. I thought that was interesting, uh, but I don't think so. I have no doubt that Jesus made good on making sure that that donkey was returned, but I think Mark has something else in mind in portraying this scene like he does. Just... Let's just think about it for a minute. The joyous pr procession that had marched down from the Mount of Olives with all the people waving their palm branches, shouting, all these shouts of acclamations, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How many people, how many people were involved in that parade? Hundreds? Thousands? We don't know. Now given all this buildup and excitement that went into this procession, what happens when Jesus finally enters the temple courts? And here's the answer. Nothing. Nothing. Why did nothing happen? Why wasn't the parade continued into the city and on into the temple courts? He was the Messiah, after all. They were recognizing that. Notice how Mark describes it. Jesus entered the, the Jerusalem, went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The end. Boring. What did Jesus look at when he was there? What did he see? I think the better question for us to ask is, what did Jesus not see? Oh. And I think what Jesus did not see was worship taking place. Instead, what Jesus does see in the temple courts is that they're being prepared as a marketplace. This is before the Passover. God's Messiah had been revealed. The Messianic secret was not a secret anymore. And now that Jesus, the Messiah, enters into the temple courts, what he finds is that the people are not prepared to meet him. There's nothing happening in the temple that would suggest that they are prepared to meet God, to meet their Savior. Instead of worship, the temple of God has become a place of commerce. A few weeks ago, we looked at John's account when Jesus cleansed the temple of the money changers and the animal sellers. We said that John puts that episode at the beginning of his gospel with the possibility that Jesus actually cleansed the temple twice, once at the beginning of the ministry and once at the end. According to the gospel of Mark, Jesus looks around at everything within the temple courts, does nothing, says nothing, and he heads for Bethany. But if we were to read on in Mark chapter 11, Jesus returns to the city the very next day, the temple courts the very next day, and it is here that Jesus curses the fig tree on the way to the city. May nobody ever eat from, fruit from you again. And once he gets to the temple courts, he begins flipping over the tables of the money changers and driving out the sellers of the, of the sacrificial animals. He's mad. He's righteously angered. Mark tells us he overturned the money table, uh, tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? They were not prepared for the Messiah. If we put this all together, what we can see is that even with their declaration that Jesus was the Messiah... And even when the Messiah appears within the courts of the temple, the people failed to recognize that God was in their midst. They had their own expectations. They had their own, their own agendas, their own aspirations, which blinded them from the reality of God so that even when the Messiah was literally standing in front of them in the temple courts, nothing was happening. They were not prepared for it. And it was these things that would cause the people to fail in recognizing the presence of God in their midst. A failure that would start on Sunday, Palm Sunday, and that failure is going to carry right on into Good Friday. Where they finally say, we have no king. We have no king but Caesar. 
Of course, Palm Sunday is the traditional beginning of the Holy Week. It's our journey that we are to make with Jesus as he looks ahead to his betrayal by those who are closest to him, as he looks ahead to being arrested and subjected to a mock trial, a rigged trial, to being beaten and scourged, finally crucified. The crime that Jesus was guilty of, that Pilate had placed over his head with a sign, read that this is the king of the Jews. That is what Jesus was guilty of. Pilate was right. He was the king of the Jews, and that was his crime. That was enough for him to be executed by a corrupt Jewish government, a Jewish authority in the temple, and the heavy hand of the Roman government. And yet, this is the kind of king that he revealed himself to be on Palm Sunday. A submissive king, a humble king, a servant king. And we can't properly make that journey with Jesus if we too miss the message of Palm Sunday. Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That is indeed true. Jesus reveals himself to be the king. And he has come to offer his people salvation. Hosanna, save us. But what kind of salvation did the people want? What kind of salvation did the people expect? What kind of salvation do we expect from the king? If we don't recognize that Jesus came to save us from our sins, then we too have missed the messianic secret that Jesus was revealing on that day. So for those who have eyes to see, for those who have ears to hear, we can say that God has given us a king and that king has come to save us for our sins and for that we rejoice. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We celebrate that today. But if that is the kind of salvation that you still need in your life. You, you think you need other kinds of salvation. That's not the most important kind of salvation you need. And if you still need that kind of salvation in your life, then let today be that day that Jesus, the King, becomes your King. Hosanna. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Jesus, God has given to us the only kind of salvation we need. It's the kind of salvation that gives us eternal life. Allows us to be with God for eternity. We have problems. We always have problems in life. We might have financial problems. We might have relationship problems. Other kinds of problems. We might think we want to be saved from that. But that's not what we really need. We need a savior to save us from our sins. That's what we need. And that's what God gave to us in the King. And so we can say this morning on this Palm Sunday, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed be our King. Let's pray together. Our God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the celebration and the atmosphere of Palm Sunday, recognizing, of course, that even those who were there that day with Jesus did not fully understand what it meant. But we do. Help us to embrace that truth again, that we have a king, we have a savior, we have a Messiah. And for all those who have not yet embraced that Messiah and the salvation that he offers, may today be that day. Open their hearts, open their minds to that free gift that you you give to all who look to Jesus in faith. Help us to grow, help us to, to bloom Help us to know you more and to tell others about you. Help us not to be afraid, but to be bold witnesses for our Lord and our Savior. We ask these things in his most precious name. Amen. I invite you to stand once again. Turn your attention to our worship screen as we sing Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
Hear now our benediction for this Palm Sunday. May our Lord, whose arms were spread on the cross to embrace the whole world, help us this week and always to take up our crosses and to follow him. Go forth to love and to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.